We've been talking about the devil and how the devil works. And what I told you was that the devil only does four or five different things, but he does them a thousand different ways. And what we have to do is we have to learn to see through his disguises. But I also told you that the devil is always fighting to take something away from God. Now, here's the first way the devil works, and here's the first way the devil worked in the Scripture. He cast doubt on the Word of God, and he changes the Word of God. Look at the question that the serpent asks in verse 1, chapter 3, verse 1. Indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? So what's he suggesting? Is God so unreasonable that he's not going to give you any of this beautiful fruit from these beautiful trees of the garden? What is the suggestion? That God is too strict. Now, when I tell you that the devil always does the same thing, he's really saying something about God. He's really casting doubt on God. He says the same thing in the garden to the first Adam, to the first, well, to the first woman, that he said into the wilderness, in the wilderness to the second Adam. You'd better eat by your own rules, not by God's rules, because God is unfair, God is unreasonable. So what does he say to Jesus? Turn these stones into bread. So, there's the suggestion here that God has banished everything, that God is unreasonable. And of course, God did not say that. Now, here's one of the reasons that we know the Bible is true. Um, an unbeliever can ask the question, well, what about the other creation accounts from the ancient world? Read them. Read them. Read them and compare them to the biblical accounts. The most popular creation account was the Babylonian account. And most of the critics believe that Genesis was written in the Babylonian era. The Babylonian account teaches that there was a great god called Marduk and a great feminine deity who was a chaos monster called Tiamat. And they had a fight. And Marduk won. And he killed Tiamat. And he, when he spread her body out, that was the earth. And Marduk spit. And where he spat, men came up. And the men spat. Sorry, ladies. And where they where they spat, women came up. That's what the Babylonians taught. The Egyptians, where Moses went to school, taught that the earth was on five pillars, two in on the sides and one in the middle. I believe it's in Isaiah, I'll look it up, says that the Lord God hung the earth on nothing. It's often said that the Hindus have an older religion than Christianity. Well, you know what the Hindus teach? They teach that the world sits on the back of an elephant who stands on the back of a turtle who swims in a cosmic sea. Read the other accounts and, and compare the accounts to what the Holy Scriptures say. Um, every effort will be made to doubt God's Word. But the reality is, when we read these other accounts, they're bizarre. And they don't do anything for us spiritually. But when we read this account, we see ourselves. 
You read any other ancient literature and you won't see yourself in a way that will help you spiritually. Now, let me say if you read, for instance, the Iliad and the Odyssey, you will see things that you can relate to, but it won't help you spiritually. And it won't touch your heart. We see ourselves in the confusion of Eve. We see ourselves in the surrender of Adam. Now, the devil suggests something that is not true about God. He suggests that God is unreasonable, that God wants to ban us from everything that we need. He says, did God say you could not eat from any tree of the garden? In verse 2, the woman responds, from the, tree, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat it or touch it, lest you die. Now, the fact is, the woman misquotes God, and she adds a rule. God did not say that the fruit could not be touched. God said that the fruit could not be eaten. I'm not saying it would have been a good idea to touch the fruit. I'm just saying that God is being misquoted, that God did not say that. Here's another spiritual lesson, the lesson of legalism. The first quote that we have from the woman is a legalistic quote. What is legalism? There are three features of legalism that are important. Legalism is when we make up a rule that is not in the Bible. That's legalism, and that's what she did. She made up a rule that God did not give. The second feature of legalism is when we require of others illegitimately and wrongly what God may actually be requiring of us legitimately or rightly. I'm a missionary. I'm a pastor. There are some things that I deny to myself that I would not deny to myself if I were not a pastor or a missionary. James chapter 3 says that the teacher will have a stricter judgment than the person who's not a teacher. Therefore, I try, unsuccessfully in many cases, to hold myself to a higher standard. It would be wrong for me to try to hold others to that standard if I was telling them things that were not in the Bible. Now, the heart of legalism is this, the third thing. The heart of legalism is delighting more in what I have given up for God than delighting in what God has given up for me. The heart of legalism is celebrating what I have done for God more than I celebrate and talk about and think about what God has done for me. That's the heart of legalism. But legalism begins right here. And let me tell you something, legalism doesn't work. Legalism will not keep you from sin. This is one of Paul's arguments in the book of Colossians. We think that making the rules will keep us from sinning. It won't. It won't keep us from sinning. And it doesn't keep her from sinning. Now, verse 4 gets at the heart of the temptation. The serpent said to the woman, You surely shall not die. First he cast doubt on God's reasonableness. As God said, you couldn't eat from any tree of the garden. But by, that's what he says in verse 1. But, but, but by verse 4, he calls God a liar. You see, it's an argument over death. There are some people who say that you know, well, all religions more or less basically teach the same thing. All religions are more or less true. And uh, no, 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 that's not true. Somebody's wrong. Not only is somebody wrong, but somebody's lying. And the quarrel is about death. The quarrel is what leads to death? The quarrel is over the question, 
what determines our experience after death? You see, this quarrel between God and the devil over death is still raging in the world today. There are people who are willing to die, willing to blow themselves up in order to kill people like me and like you because they believe if they die killing people who believe what I believe and people who believe what you believe, that they will go to heaven forever. And their idea of heaven is a very masculine idea of heaven, full of sensuality. They believe this just as strongly as I believe in the resurrection. And in many ways, they are better servants of their master than I am of my master. And they have believed their master's theology of death. They believe that a certain kind of death will lead to a certain kind of life. Here's what you've got to understand about Christianity. Christianity is not a sacrifice that we make. That's legalism. Christianity is a sacrifice that we trust. Our confidence in what happens to us when we die does not grow from the fact that we realize that we've given up so many things for God. Our confidence grows from the fact that Christ laid down His life for us. That's the sacrifice that we trust. It's trusting in that sacrifice which gets us into heaven when we die. But you see, the serpent is defying God and saying, God doesn't know what He's talking about when He's talking about death. Listen to me. I'll tell you how to live. I'll tell you how to preserve your life. Now, sin is entering the world, at least the human creation. It's already entered the angelic creation. And in a, in, a, in a way, I guess it's already entered the animal creation. Sin is entering the human creation in chapter 3. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS Seminary's database, please visit tvsseminary.com. Um, let me say something about angels because the Satan is an angel, a fallen angel. And let me say something about animals because the serpent was an animal. We got all kind of questions about how this happened. I mean, how does he enter the serpent? How, why was the serpent cursed? God doesn't tell us somebody else's story. There's a wonderful set of children's books called the Chronicles of Narnia. And in the Chronicles of Narnia, the Christ figure, Aslan, he's not Christ, he's somebody who reminds us of Christ. The great lion, Aslan, says to one of the children, I only tell you your own story. You know what? There may be a Bible for animals, but we don't know where it is, and we don't know what it is, and we can't read it. There may be a Bible for angels, but we don't know where it is, and we don't know what it is and we can't read it. We know that there's a Bible for us. We know that there's a book which tells us our story. We know a little bit about the creatures below us called animals, but we don't know very much. We know a little bit about the creatures above us called angels, but we don't know very much. We're only told our story. We know a lot about our story. And let's pay attention to our story and let's do the business we're supposed to do with our story. And let's don't worry too much about the animal story or the angel story. You know what? One day we'll know all about those stories, but not now. You know why? Because we're still in the middle of our story. Our story's not over yet. You know, there may be another Bible in the future for somebody else. And you may be in it. We don't know everything God's going to do in the future. So let's be sure that we get our part of the story right, okay? 
But the great argument is to believe what God tells us about death. You know, I talk to unbelievers all the time. It's my joy, it's my job, it's my opportunity. And occasionally, I'll hear an unbeliever say this. Well, you know, I think it's going to be like this. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. What are you talking about? What do you mean you think it's going to be like this? How on earth would you know? What right do you have to have any opinion at all about death? Have you ever been dead and come back? Have you, have you ever met somebody who was dead and came back? I have. His name is Jesus. I have met him. He's my Savior. We better believe what God tells us about death because the devil will tell us lies. Now, in chapter 2, I told you that the most important thing to understand from the Old Testament was that the whole Old Testament points to Jesus. I think most Christians would agree with that. The majority of Christians say, well, you know, that's probably true. But my, my opinion on the second most important thing in the Old Testament, probably most Christians would disagree with, but I said it was this. The second most important thing to understand from the Old Testament is that Adam and Eve did not eat the fruit because they were hungry. I tell you the reason they did not eat the fruit. I didn't tell you the reason that they did eat the fruit. Because this is part of the important thing to understand. Adam and Eve did eat the fruit because they believed a lie about God. They believed that God was mistaken about death. And they even, at least Eve, because the scripture says that Eve was deceived, they believed that God had an unworthy motive in not wanting to eat them, not wanting them to eat the truth. You see, God told them, don't eat the fruit because I'm trying to protect you from death. The devil told them that God didn't want them to eat the fruit because he was trying to protect himself, because he didn't want anyone equal to him, that he was afraid of that. And so in verse 5, the, the serpent says, God knows that in the day you eat from it, your, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. So God wants to keep you from becoming like Him, and that's why He told you not to eat the fruit. Now, um, my dear brothers and sisters, that's not only a lie. That's the opposite of the truth. God's whole goal is to make us like Himself, especially in the sense that we know what is good and we know what is evil and we choose the good and we reject the evil. He doesn't want us to know evil by experiencing the evil, which is what our first parents chose to do.